everything inside me. Hyperdimensional entities have been recognized, discussed and warned about for literally millennia throughout the history of humanity. Naturally, there are many people who scoff at the very idea of such beings, believing them to be fictitious inventions of the human mind. However, the fact that so many cultures, traditions, religions and spiritualities have discussed the nature of these creatures, using different terms but essentially describing the same thing, gives credence to the idea that they exist. We have been cautioned for millennia that humanity is under psychic attack by a group of energetic discarnate beings that see thoughts of judgment, separation, anxiety, anger and fear in order to generate luge or negative emotional energy that they siphon off as food. In searching for what force is really behind the construction of the NWO and the grander conspiracy, one is bound to investigate these hyperdimensional entities, who may be the original handlers, puppet masters and mind control perpetrators manipulating the whole of mankind. We have to take seriously the idea that the hidden rulers of this crazy world are invisible, or at least, operate from frequencies beyond normal perception. After all, no one knows exactly from where thoughts originate. If there were a force that could control which thoughts are beamed into the mind, then every single living person would be vulnerable to psychic attack. These hyperdimensional entities are said to be able to infiltrate your mind, make their voice sound like yours, and entice you to do their bidding, all with the aim of generating fear, which is their food. Are they are the gods of yore that demanded sacrifice? Are they the evil spirits that possess people? Are they the masters of trickery who continually try to keep us in fear and out of our center of power, our heart, the following are some of the different traditions and cultures that describe these hyper-dimensional entities using their own terms and ideas. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. The ancient Gnostics were named after Gnosis, the Greek word for knowledge, or insight. Gnosticism was a loosely organized religious and philosophical movement that flourished in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. The Gnostics believed that the material world was the result of a primordial error on the part of a divine being, usually called Sophia, or Wisdom, or the Logos. They attributed the creation and control of the material world to a semi-divine, ignorant creature known who was called Saklas, or the Fool, Ildebaeth, or the Blind God, or the Demiurge. From the Greek, Demiurgos, which means craftsman, but which the Gnostics meant as the architect, or lesser creative force. In Gnostic mythology and cosmology, both Sophia and the Demiurge, are subordinate to the Supreme Being, or Cosmos, or God. The Demiurge was antagonistic to anything spiritual, and had a group of servants known as the Archons, Greek meaning ruler. The research of Gnostic scholar, John Lash, reveals that the Gnostics were early mystic shamans who reached high states of consciousness, knew their direct connection with the cosmos, and honored the importance of the female principle, Sophia, to live balanced lives. He concludes that the Catholic Church feared their power, so it killed them, and banished the survivors underground. The Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in Qumran, Palestine, and the Nag Hammadi Codices discovered in Egypt, both in the 1940s, are important Gnostic texts which expose the truth about the Archons. Here is a quote from the Apocryphon of John, a Nag Hammadi text. They sought to overpower humanity in its psychological and perceptual functions. Although they saw that human thinking was superior to theirs. For indeed their delight is bitter, and their beauty is depraved and their triumph is in deception, or opotent, leading astray, for their own structure is without divinity. The Gnostics were postulating the idea of a predatory alien presence, that took delight in others' pain, and that used deception as a tool. 
Disconnected from their own power, without divinity, they became parasites that had to hijack the energy of others to survive. These same forces are called demons in the Christian tradition. In this famous quote from Ephesians 6.12, the creatures are actually called rulers and authorities, which directly echoes the language used to describe the archons in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Nag Ham texts. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Christianity also contains a tradition of exorcism of evil spirits. The Gospel contains many stories of Jesus casting out the evil spirits. This tradition continues to the current day. Father Gabriella Morf was a former official in the Vatican, who served as exorcist for the Diocese of Rome for 30 years. He was also the founder of the International Association of Exorcists. The Shaitan, or Shayateen, belongs to pre-Islamic Arabian mythology, however there is a story that Muhammad was tricked by one, realized it, and came out publicly the next day to correct what he said. Although there are debates by scholars over the historicity of this incident. In the Quran, there is the story of Iblis, the first Shaitan, who was apparently made by Allah, or God, from a fire so pure that not even smoke could mar its beauty. This is interesting, because reference to the archons as made from smokeless fire crops up repeatedly across different traditions. Iblis refused to bow to Adam, who was after all a mere man made of clay, so God banished him from heaven. Iblis swore to take revenge on Adam and all clay men like him. Iblis is considered the lord of all shayateen, and is said to have gathered an army of shayateen and jinn to persecute mankind. A shaitan is described as a sweeping force and a whispering voice, visible only to donkeys, who pray desperate warnings when they see it approaching. This again is noteworthy, since this highlights the theme that these hyperdimensional entities are outside the normal range of normal human perception, but not outside the perceptions of other creatures such as animals like donkeys, or cats, and not outside the range of human perception when a person, through will, intent, or even psychedelics, expands his or her perception range. In slight contrast to the view of the Archons as presented in the works of Castaneda and elsewhere, the Native American Indian traditions conceived hyperdimensional entities as a mind virus, which they called Wetiko. The Wetiko is based in the unconsciousness of the collective psyche. Wetiko is a master of distraction, making us look outside of ourselves and find issues and problems there, rather than looking within. We find people or groups outside of ourselves that match our projections of evil or darkness, then falsely believe the darkness is only outside of ourselves. This becomes a self-perpetuating feedback loop where we become unwitting propagators of Wetiko. Paul suggests that whether we look at Wetiko as a cunning enemy out to destroy us, or a cheeky challenger out to prod and poke us into a fuller awareness, is a matter of perspective. Obviously, it is more empowering to view the created situations and outcomes of the mind virus as gifts, rather than as curses or burdens, because the former view may spur us on to become better people, while the latter may lead us to anger and hate. We do, at least, have that much choice, but unless we are already a fully awakened or enlightened individual, we do not yet have the choice of whether to invite Wetiko into our lives or not. It's already here, and it's not going away, unless every last speck of shadow is fully acknowledged. From this perspective, the hyperdimensional entities are part of a single mind virus which tries to trick us at every turn, causing us to see problems in others, or psychological projection, when really the problems originate in ourselves. Even though there is a lot of evidence for the existence of archons, we have to consider the possibility that we may be anthropomorphizing them. Perhaps they are actual creatures, or perhaps they are symbolic representations of our, our shadows, our wounds and our fears. 
Either way, when those tempting seductive and tormenting thoughts arrive in your head, as happens to every human on the world, you have a very real battle in front of you, and inside of you. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This Everything Inside Me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.